morning. Amen. Thank you, Patsy. You know, in baseball, they have walk-up music when guys walk up to the plate. So that's my walk-up music to do the announcement. So thank you for that, Patsy. I appreciate it so very much. Welcome to Abbots Creek Missionary Baptist Church to each one of you here this morning. We trust you've come to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. For those of you that are here in the sanctuary as well as those that are joining us online, thank you so very much. If you are with us for the very first time, I want to encourage you to avail yourself of the connection card. There's a code. You can just run your smartphone over that in the bulletin. Uh, you can also fill that out online with our app, and I encourage you to download our, our church app. Uh, and we just want to have a record of your being here with us, pray for you, and if there's any way that we can minister to you in the future, please let us know. But thank you for being with us this morning. Let me draw your attention to the bulletin real quick, just remind you of a couple things. Uh, I'm sure that Andrea will mention something about the Ladies of Lee, so I won't steal her thunder. I'll let her uh, give you more details about that. But church council, uh, those that are members of that, uh, just make note of the meeting this afternoon at 3 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Uh, there is a note in the bulletin about a mission trip for August 13th through 20th. Uh, Hugh, you can contact, talk to Hugh, or there's a number in the bulletin. You can find more information about that. And then I want to give a plug for one of our children's events. I want to thank Sandy for driving uh, the church van last night for our youth activity to Winter Jam. We had a great time together. So I appreciate Sandy so very much being willing to drive for our student ministry. But there is a children's uh, sponsored ministry opportunity uh, activity on March the 13th. It's on the back of your bulletin, uh, bowling. And uh, I'll be going to this and encouraging our students to participate as well and families. So uh, just encourage all families, take a look at that on the back of the bulletin. If you have questions about that or want more details, talk to Sandy. And uh, again, that is on March the 13th. Well, once again, thank you for being here with us this morning. Appreciate you so very much. And as we continue our time in worship, Andrew is coming to lead us. Good morning. As Josh mentioned earlier, we will be having the Ladies of Lee come and do a concert on Tuesday night, March 8th. If you don't know who the Ladies of Lee are, they are a ladies, you given from the name, collegiate choir from Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee. So that will be at 6.30 on that Tuesday night. If you have reached out to me about paying for a hotel or hosting them in your own home. I'll be reaching out to you this week to give you some more details about that. But thank you so much for all of you, all of you who have um, felt a uh, tug on your heart to uh, host them in this way. But I ask that you would stand up with us today as we sing to our Lord Almighty this morning together.
So this was a little unplanned today, but felt like it was appropriate. So in 1998, I was presented this bread, and this is real bread by the way, that's been shellacked and in my office now since 1998. Um, I was presented this in a square in Kiev, Ukraine um, in 1998. I've been to Kiev on seven occasions as part of mission trips where that was where we started and then we branched out from there. Been to over a dozen mission trips in Ukraine. It was in Ukraine in 1998 when God affirmed to me that he was calling me to preach. And I surrendered to the ministry after I got back from that mission trip. So there's a special place in my heart for the people of Ukraine, special place for the church of Ukraine because in 1991, Joe Hester, who led our trips, said basically when the Soviet Union fell, we better go into Ukraine while we can and plant as many churches as we can because the time may come when we can't do it anymore, which is what we're facing now if things go according to the way they probably will. Um, I have been in contact directly with friends on the ground throughout this entire ordeal. Uh, keeping up with two of my dear friends in Lviv, Ukraine, who've been updating me. The Baptists of Ukraine have been giving updates as well. And I just wanted to share with you that the church on the ground in Ukraine, and I'm talking about the Baptists particularly, I don't know about other denominations, but the Baptists of Ukraine and churches that we helped plant years ago are on the ground feeding people, clothing people, taking people into their homes, and ministering as war is exploding all around them. And so we're going to pray this morning. We want to pray and partner with our Ukrainian churches this morning. They've asked us to pray, and so we're going to pray for them. We want to also pray for any of our troops that may be going over to the region or already over there that may be helping out in any way. And we need to pray for the leadership of our country this morning, regardless of your party affiliation and views on a political leader of any sort. I can't imagine the difficult decisions that lie ahead for our leadership. And we need to pray for them, pray for wisdom. Uh, I, I mean, you're, you're torn between do you do this or do you do this? And if I do this, this might happen. And I can't even imagine what's going on behind the scenes. So let's pray for that this morning as well. And uh, if you would join me now as we pray for those things. Father in heaven, God, first of all, thank you that in the midst of chaos, there's no chaos with you. Thank you, God, that we know that while it seems that the world is out of control, that ultimately it's in your control. We know, God, that in the end, we know how all things are going to turn out, and we trust that one day all evil will be vanquished and King Jesus will reign forever, and we thank you for that promise. But God, you have left us here for this time, for such a time as this, and we pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, all over that country, Lord. I pray for specific friends of mine and others. I pray, Lord, for the churches all across Ukraine, not just Baptists, but Lord, for them especially because we've befriended them and helped them and partnered with them through the years. I pray for the leaders of the Baptists of Ukraine. I pray for the leaders of the seminary in Lviv this morning, the leaders of our seminary in Kiev, leaders in seminaries scattered across Ukraine, Lord, who are facing possibly going underground to even worship you. I lift them up to you. I pray for those who are ministering on the streets of Ukraine in the midst of danger and that you would use them mightily. I pray for homes that have been broken up, fathers and, and, and mothers who have left their children, Lord, sent their children ahead, wives and husbands separated at the borders, Lord. I pray for them and their families that they would be able to see their families again. 
I pray, Lord God, that you would do a great and incredible spiritual work throughout this entire situation. And so we lift them up to you today. May you be glorified in the midst of tragedy. And I pray, Lord, for our soldiers, our armed forces that may be involved. I pray for all of our heads of state and everyone in leadership this morning, God, that you would give them great wisdom to know what to do next every step of the way. I pray that they would seek your guidance, Lord, your wisdom for all that they do. And Lord, I pray that we would continue to pray for all those in Ukraine and that you would do a great work in the midst of this. We thank you for what you're going to do, and we ask, Lord, that you would also bless our time of worship here in this place this morning. As we focus on the Word of God, may you use it for your glory to build us up, to grow us into the image of Jesus Christ, that we would walk away from here, Lord, having a greater sense of purpose and a greater love for you. Change us, O oh God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
you would this morning, turn in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. Today we'll be in chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. And in just a moment, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. Nehemiah 2, 1 through 10. We are uh, in a series that we started last week um, called God's People in God's Place, Doing What God Called Them to Do. If you missed last Sunday, uh, that's okay. Each message does stand on its own. However, the series itself is a building block uh, to a, an end point at the end of the series. So if you get a chance, if you missed it, uh, I would encourage you to go back and listen online uh, so that you can follow along with the entire series. So again, Nehemiah, and today it'll be chapter 2. Don't you hate it when things happen like the power going out? Do you hate it when the power goes out? Are we spoiled a little bit? You know, but the power goes out, and it's like, oh man, what am I going to do for the next little bit? And your TV goes out, and and uh, you can't watch TV. You got a ball game on you want to watch, and you can't watch that, and uh, th that kind of thing. It's also frustrating. You go out to get in the car, and the car won't start. Right? Nothing worse than a dead battery. Believe me, I know about dead batteries from the battery days. Nothing worse than going out and that car that you rely on, that you're counting on, you get in it and or nothing at all, just a click. It's frustrating. In the day of computer ages, there's nothing worse than having a bad internet connection. And you're trying to do something and that little spinning wheel starts going because your internet's not working properly. Uh, all kinds of things that we run into today that, that just don't work when we want them to at times. One thing I can assure you today, God is always at work. There's never a time when God is not working. Never a time when God is not accomplishing His purposes for all things. God is always at work. The question is, do we recognize that? Do we see that happening? Do we rely on God's work in our lives? That's a question we need to consider this morning. And is it possible, and if this really fits with all that's going on in the world right now, is it possible for God to work even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of bad circumstances? Is God still working even when somebody who's carrying out evil actions is at work? Is God still at work? Can God work in people who don't know Him? That's another question we want to think about this morning. So as we go to this passage, and we think about the series, God's people in God's place doing what God called them to do, are we, first of all, individually, are we where we're supposed to be? Are we carrying out God's plan for our life individually, for your family, for your home, for you personally. And then as a church, are we doing everything that God has called us to do? Are we being what God called us to be as a church here at Abbott's Creek Missionary Baptist Church, but also as a church in the state of North Carolina, in the United States and around the world? Are we doing what God has called us to do? So let's stand if you're able this morning as we read from Nehemiah chapter 2. We're reminded that all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we read from God's Word. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before, Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? 
So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give the, me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king, and the king granted them to me, according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river, gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. And when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, Ammonite officials heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. You can be seated. The main idea I want you to take away today from our passage is the good hand of the Lord is always at work. Let me say that again. The good hand of the Lord is always at work. And we're going to look at two specific ways in which God's work is being done today. And the first is this. God works in and through believers. Through, excuse me, through His people. I forgot I reworded that. Through His people. God works in and through His people. So what we're going to look at first is we continue to watch God at work in the life of Nehemiah. That He's doing something great in Nehemiah. Last time we were together, we looked at the thought that Nehemiah was broken over the children of Israel and its condition. Broken over Jerusalem and the walls being torn down. As long as those walls were torn down, the temple was in danger, the people were in danger, the city of Jerusalem was in danger, and could not function as God had called it to function. It couldn't carry out God's plans for it. Not the city, not the people. Nehemiah was broken over that. Remember last week we looked at the fact that he, he prayed and he fasted for days and days over this. It literally broke his heart. So God was already at work in his heart. God was already giving him a burden for the children of Israel. But he continues to work through Nehemiah in this passage. We come to chapter 2, verse 1. It's in the month of Nisan, which is the first month of their calendar. It would be approximately March or April in our calendar. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him. Now this is key, when wine was before him. At the end of chapter 1, we are told that Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king. Now what the cupbearer did was, he came in, and when wine was brought, or food was brought to the king, the cupbearer tasted it first to make sure it wasn't poisoned, so that he would die instead of the king if it had been poisoned. That was Nehemiah's job. Do you think that King Artaxerxes was pretty happy about having Nehemiah to do that for him? <laughs> of course he was. And so there was. I want you to picture that there would be no greater time, no closer moment in the life of the king and the cupbearer. There would be no time that they were closer than the moment that the cupbearer took the wine and drank it and tasted it for the king. He was literally in that moment willing to give his life for the king. So this is a perfect time for Nehemiah to approach the king. And so the Bible says that he had never been sad, in verse 1, in the king's presence. So when he went to taste the, the wine for the king, Nehemiah is sad in his presence. And the Bible tells us in verse 2, the king then asked him, so why is, why is your face so sad? You're not sick. There's no reason for your face to be sad. Why is your face sad? This is nothing but just sorrow of heart. There's something going on in your heart that you are sorrowful for. There's no other explanation for it. He says, then in verse 2, the Bible says that Nehemiah became dreadfully afraid. Now why is this man who's just tasted wine for the king and basically made sure that the king was protected. Why is he scared? Because the king has recognized that he is sad. Well, if you go over just to the right, just a little book, bit to the book of Esther, and you look at Esther chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, 
When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. This is a sign of mourning. And he went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate. Why did he stop at the king's gate? For no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In other words, you couldn't go into the king's presence with sadness or mourning because that doesn't look good for the king. The king may be thinking, well, hey, shouldn't you be all happy and joyful living in my kingdom? If you're sad, then that, that's a bad reflection on me. It makes me look bad as a king that you're walking around with a sad face. And so nobody did that. And oftentimes it meant death if you showed up in front of the king with sadness. So back to Nehemiah chapter 2, in verse 2, that's why he's dreadfully afraid. And the Bible says that he said to the king, May the king live forever. Now I want to tell you, when you're about to ask somebody for a favor, you might want to start out with something positive. There was an old book that I read back when I was in business years ago. It was called The One Minute Manager. And it was basically about when you called an employee in to scold them, start with a minute worth of praise before you begin to set up the bad news. Well, that's kind of what's going on here. He's setting up the bad news with the good news. May the king live forever. But then he says the truth about his heart. He says, why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. He, Nehemiah says to the king, very boldly, he says, why shouldn't I be sad? This is not about your kingdom, King Artaxerxes. This is about my people. This is about the city of Jerusalem, God's city and God's people. And the city gates are burned and, and the walls are burned and crumbled. And when I look at that, it breaks my heart. Why shouldn't I be sad when I see that? And I would say to us this morning, why shouldn't we be sad when we look at the condition spiritually of our towns. Look at the condition spiritually of our state and our nation. Look at the condition spiritually of the world. Why shouldn't it break our hearts? Why shouldn't we be sad about that when we look around the world? But what I want you to see is, is that Nehemiah has got God working on him. God's working on him. I mean, he went from being burdened about the people and the, and the city to I'm going to do something about it. And why did he do that? If you'll look over at chapter 2, verse 8, you'll see the reason. It says, And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The good hand of God was upon Nehemiah. It was the good hand of God that was working in Nehemiah's heart that gave him a burden for the people of God. It was the good hand of God working in Nehemiah's heart that gave him a burden for the city of God. And the fact that they were not able to be what God had called them to be and do what God had called them to do. It was the, the hand of God at work in him that brought that burden. But it didn't stop with a burden. It went a step further. And the good hand of the Lord upon Nehemiah caused him to say, I've got to do something. I want to tell you something. It's not good enough just to be broken over lostness and, and the condition of the church today. It's not good enough to be broken. We need to be like Nehemiah and let God do a work in us so that we will also go and do something about it. Do something about it. That's what Nehemiah is about to do. So the good hand of the Lord was on him, working in him and now he's working through him as he approached the king. I remember one time, I had a weed eater. And I, actually it was a steel, so I guess it's a grass trimmer. Weed eater is a brand. Kind of like Kleenex and tissues, you know. So I, I had a, a trimmer that I had for 20-some years. A steel, I'm putting in a plug for steel here. A steel trimmer, 20-some years. For 20 some years, I walked over, picked up that trimmer, keep wanting to call it a weed eater, picked up that trimmer, punched a little bubble on it five times to prime the pump, turned the switch on and all, pumped that little button on there, one, two, three, crank. 20 some years, 
Never touched it. Never had it in a shop. Never anything. It always worked. It was just pick it up and do something with it. Okay? And then one day I went and I did all that and I pulled the cord and the cord broke off in my hand. And if you've ever had that happen, there's a little spring up inside of that thing, this little coil up inside of that thing, and it just went... I spent the next five hours, and one thing you're going to learn about me, I don't give up easily. You know, this is why my wife hands me wads of necklaces that are all, you know, wadded up, because I'll work on it until it's fixed. I won't quit. And I'm, I was that way over that tremor. I'm, not, I'm not, not giving up on this thing. So I broke it all apart. I know nothing about the inside of that kind of thing. But I broke it all apart. I looked in there at that spring. I worked it on that thing for hours and hours and hours. And I got that thing all put back together. And I went over there and I pulled that cord. And guess what it did? It actually did fire up and run. The truth of the matter is I had to work inside it before I could work through it. I had to work in it. And God oftentimes is working in us so that He can then work through us. Now God can work in spite of us too, right? But He wants to work through us. And that begins with Him working in us. And He was working in Nehemiah. And then He began to work out through Nehemiah as Nehemiah moves forward and goes to the king. God is working in us and through us, His people. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, the Bible says this, For it is God who works, where? In you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Listen, what we do for God is Him working in us. You know what that says to me? I can't even take the glory for when I get it right as a Christian. Because God is doing something in me that's causing me to go and do His will. His Spirit is working in me. His Spirit is convicting me. His Spirit is empowering me. His Spirit is changing me. His Spirit is working in me so that He can work through me. It's Him doing this incredible work. Over in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. The Bible says this, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Not transform yourself, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove, so that you may live out what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you and I live out the will of God individually? How do you and I live out the will of God as a church? How do we do that? It's by allowing God to to transform us, to change us, and mold us more into the image of Jesus Christ. And He does that, and then we're able to carry out His plans. But it's Him working in us, and then through us. So let's let this be our prayer this morning. And I pray that you'll write this verse down. Maybe you put this card, make a card with this verse from Hebrews chapter 13, 20 through 21. Maybe you put it on your refrigerator. Maybe you stick it somewhere. Maybe you put it as a pop-up reminder in your phone throughout the day. However you want to do it. But I would encourage you to let this be your prayer. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may He do this. Make you complete in every good work to do His will. Is that a good goal to have? For us individually, is that a good goal to have? For us as a church, is that a good goal to have? That we would be complete and doing every good work that He's called us to? Doing His will? Working where? In you. What is well pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. How is it He's going to complete us? Him working in us. Let's pray that God will make us complete. Make us more like Christ in every good work 
to do His will. Let's pray for that for ourselves individually. Let's pray that 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 will be Him making me complete as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, as a grandparent, as a child in a family's home, as a kid under their parents' leadership, as a co-worker, as a church member, as a Christian in general, that God would complete us for every good work in His will. What a great thing if that were to happen to us. And it starts with prayer. Go back over to Nehemiah chapter 2. And there's a second way in which we see God at work. And that is this. God works in and through unbelievers. Through what? God works in and through unbelievers. So as we dig on through the passage here, verse 4 tells us, Then the king said to me, What do you request? Now, the king could have easily said, off with your head, based on the rule of the day. But he didn't do that. The king said, what do you you request? You know what I see happening here? It doesn't say it in the text, but what I see happening here is, is that just in this moment, I don't know how prideful King Artaxerxes is, but most kings were pretty prideful. And... And in this moment, he was humble enough to say, you know what, it doesn't matter that you're sad. What do you want? What is it that you request? The king said to me, what do you request? So Nehemiah broke out his list and said, here's what I want. Is that what happened? What did he do? Wow. I I love this verse right here. Because this is like, you know when the Bible says pray continuously? It doesn't mean that I utter prayers all day long, nonstop, 24-7. You know, like if you go over and listen to the Muslims over in Israel constantly chanting prayers all day long. It doesn't mean that. This is a perfect example of praying continuously. This is, you're in the middle of the day and something's happening and you're in the midst of an event and you're about to say something very important that may change your life and the lives of others. And just for a moment, it's like, Nehemiah said, you know what? I prayed for days. I fasted for days. I prepared for this moment. The king says, what do you want? But I'm going back to God just one last time. Just one more time, Lord, I'm coming to you. And he prayed. He prayed. So before you say a word that you know might be controversial, before you're making some important decision, maybe you've already prayed about it, but maybe just one last time to yourself right in that moment before your mouth opens and you say the words, maybe you just say, God, help me here. Say the right thing. So I prayed to the God of heaven. It doesn't say what he said. I can just imagine that he prayed, Lord, let this go well. Let this king respond well. Let me say the right thing in the right way. But he prayed. Verse 5, and then he spoke to the king. And again, if it pleases the king, he set him up with some nice little words there. If it pleases the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, which apparently he had at this point, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Send me. Now think about this for a minute. This is not just Nehemiah saying, hey, send me, you know, and Nehemiah's just some Israelite there that wants to go help out. This is the cupbearer asking for a lot lot of time off. Okay? This is the guy who's responsible for the king's life when the wine comes before him. Who's saying, hey, I need a few weeks, I need a few months, I need a couple years, I need some time to go and rebuild Jerusalem. This is not, I need some time to run to the store for a few hours. So he asked him that, and the Bible says that he may rebuild it. Now don't miss this again. Nehemiah has gone from a burden about the people of God, a burden about the city of God, to I want to go and rebuild it, I want to be a part of of the rebuilding process. Now you're going to find out that Nehemiah doesn't go with the intention of doing it all by himself. We're going to find that out in, in later chapters. But he wants to go and do his part to rebuild it. How many times do we talk about the problems that we see 
We fuss about them, we complain about them, we talk to them about them with our friends, with our co-workers, our, our classmates. Oh, we should do this, and we should do this, and we should do that. How many times does it lead to us actually saying, what do I need to do to help with this? To go and actually work. And this is true in the church. I'm not talking about anything I've seen or observed here, but you, you tell me if I'm wrong. How many times through history in churches have you seen people talk more about what we ought to be doing than actually doing something about what we should be doing and getting involved? So these are things that we have to say, you know, I'm going to get involved. I, I'm going to step up to the plate here. So he, he finds favor. And in verse 6 it says, The king said to me, and the queen also is sitting beside of him. Now I always ask myself, okay, would it, does it make any difference that the queen was sitting beside him? Why did he mention that? Could he not just have easily just left that little phrase out there with the parent parentheses there? Couldn't he just left that little parenthetical phrase out of it? Sure. So there must be some reason he wanted to place that little line in there. The queen also was sitting next to him. It could be that this queen had a little influence on the king's heart. By the way, this is Damaspia, the queen's name. Now, think through this a minute. Esther was the stepmother to King Artaxerxes. And what did Esther do in the book of Esther? She went where? Before the king. And so it's possible here that, you know, that he has a, a heart for what his stepmother did. He's reminded of that. Now the queen's sitting there. I don't know if she said something to him, but possibly she influenced him in this moment. I don't know. He says, how long is the journey going to be? How long are you going to be away from being my cupbearer? That's what he's probably thinking. How long is the journey going to be? And when will you come back? And so it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So the king said, I'm going to send you, and then he gave him a time. And then verse 7, furthermore, I said to the king, so he, okay, I got permission to go, but I'm going to push this a little bit further. And so in verse 7, he says, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, beyond the Euphrates. Let governors of the region, let me have letters for them, that they'll permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. So basically, he's asking for letters that will transfer the king's authority to Nehemiah. So Nehemiah is going with the authority of the king and will be able to get through to Judah. Verse 8, And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he would give timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, to the, for the temple and for the city wall, for the house that I'm going to occupy. Nehemiah is going long enough for a house. So he's transferring this. Lumber was a precious commodity in that day, and they had to guard it. And so Asaph is the keeper of the king's forest. He's the keeper of the lumber. This is the guy that won't let you out of Lowe's without paying. Okay, So he's, he's the lumber guy. And he's there, and he's got to be paid. He's got to be, excuse me, he's got to have letters saying the king saying it's okay to take all this lumber. Imagine how much lumber they got to take. Well, what happened? Verse 8. And the king granted them to me. Now why would the king do that? This is not a Christian king. Why would he do that? The end of verse 8 tells us, According to the good hand of my God upon me. So the good hand of God upon Nehemiah worked in Nehemiah's heart. The good hand upon Nehemiah worked in Nehemiah's heart to cause him to act and to want to go and do something to rebuild the walls. But at the same time, the reason that the king gave Nehemiah what he needed was because the good hand of God was working in Nehemiah. So when the good hand of God is working in my life, God may turn around and work in some unbeliever's life affecting what I'm trying to do. Does that make sense? Verse 9, Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. And then look at this. Nehemiah didn't even ask for this. And the king 
had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me on top of that. Why? Because the good hand of the Lord was working with Nehemiah. And so, as part of that, this all tells us, this affirms to us this. God's plan was to rebuild those walls. God's plan was to rebuild those cities. God's plan was for God's people to be in God's place doing what God called them to do. And God worked in the life of Nehemiah to bring it about. And as He was working in the life of Nehemiah, He worked in the lives of unbelievers to still bring about His plan. And He can do the exact same thing for us. We're not look at verse 10 this morning any further there's opposition comes up, and we'll save that for a couple of weeks from now. But let me just say this. When you go to do God's work, there will be opposition. God works in and through unbelievers. So in 1998, got on a boat, kind of like a cruise boat, but not for that purpose, got on a boat in Kiev, Ukraine, went down the Dnieper River to many of the cities that have been all over the news, including Kherson, that's been on the news. We traveled down and we came to the city of Odessa, which you've probably seen on all the maps because it's a major port. It's a place where they had submarine uh, stations and all that back in the day. Odessa was still in a region where they had a lot of Russian influence and there were leaders in the government there in Odessa, Ukraine that didn't want us there. They didn't want us there. Don't you? We don't want you to come into Odessa. Our plan was to give them thousands of pounds of rice and food and, and give it to the mayor for the city and then go into the city and share the gospel and give out Bibles. And they said, no, you're not coming in. Not going to happen. So, rather than give up and go on to the next city, Dr. Mac Brunson, who was the pastor at Green Street at that time, and he was under my leadership of, of a team that I took over there, he said, let's gather on the top deck of the ship at 6 a.m. in the morning. Everybody that wants to come and join me on the top deck of the ship. So we went up on the top deck of the ship and he read the story of the battle of Jericho. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to prayer walk the top deck of this ship seven times. And we're going to stop on the front deck of the ship and we're going to look at the city of Odessa and we're going to shout that God would bring the walls down. And we did. To this day, i got goosebumps right now because it's one of the most moving things I've ever done in my spiritual life. We were all weeping and praying and crying, and we got in front of that boat, and we just all screamed to the top of our lungs, just shouted for the walls to come down in Odessa. About two hours later, the mayor contacted the captain of the boat and said, okay, y'all can come into our city and you can give us the rice and the beans and all that stuff, but you can't talk about your Jesus and you can't give out any Bibles. About two hours later, he contacted the captain of the boat and he said, y'all can come and you can do whatever you want to do. And we went up 189, 189 steps going up into Odessa. And we stood at the top of that square that I saw just yesterday with tanks all over it. Stood at the top of that square and we led over 450 people to Jesus Christ that day. And we started a church there with a pastor there and my friend Dale Ledbetter who served as a missionary there for 13 years. He posted a picture yesterday of that church ministering to people in Odessa in the midst of the tragedy that's going on right now. God worked in the heart of a lost mayor to make all that happen. And God can work in unbelievers around us. He can work through an unbelieving spouse, work through an unbelieving child, an unbelieving parent, an unbelieving friend, an unbelieving fellow church uh, goer. He can work in unbelievers. God can do great works even through the lost. And He does that. 
on a regular basis. One of the greatest examples of that is in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16 with Pharaoh. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. God raised up Pharaoh for that purpose. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. Listen to what it says. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 6. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? God is at work. And nobody can stop what God wants to do. He is all powerful. And He can work in the lives of unbelievers. He works in the lives of unbelievers to bring them to the point of trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But He also works in them to bring about His purposes. We may look at what we believe God wants us to do as a church. And we may think that unbelievers in our community, unbelievers in our state, unbelievers in our nation, in our world, will stand in our way. Nothing can stand in the way of our God. If God wants to do it, if God has a desire to do it, God can use us. In spite of opposition, He can use us. I stood on the border with soldiers on the Romanian-Ukrainian border. Stood on the border with soldiers armed with machine guns from Romania. Standing there guarding the border of Romania. Stood there scared to death. Literally, you heard the phrase, shaking in my boots. I was shaking in my shoes. Scared. And we went over and gave them Bibles and shared the Gospel with them. Now, they didn't get saved, but we did that and we planted that seed. God can help you even in fear, when there's fear, even when there's opposition, even when there's a great enemy. Nehemiah may have thought that the king stood in his way. But he prayed, and he went, and he asked, and God worked in the king to make it happen. And God can do the same for our church. And God can do the same for you and for the church universal. If we seek to do God's will, God's good hand, will be upon us and work as we work. Will you pray with me? As we come to our time of invitation, there may be somebody in the room you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He died on the cross at Calvary for your sins. He was buried and He rose again from the grave. And if you believe that in your heart and call on Him to be your Lord and Savior, He'll save you today. And give you eternal life in heaven. If you want to do that, Pastor Josh and I will be down front as we sing. You come and tell us, I want to pray to receive Christ. If you're watching online, you can pray right there where you are. And ask Him to save you. And then reach out to us and tell us of your decision so that we can follow up with you. Maybe there's somebody who wants to join the church today. You just let us know that. And we'll follow up with you. You can come forward and tell us you want to join the church. We'll walk you through the process. Or you can reach out to us by phone or email this week and let us know. And we'll do the same. But all across the room, all across watching online, God wants us to be His people in His place doing what He called us to do. And He wants to work in you and through you and through those around you to bring about His purposes. Surrender your heart to Him and pray and ask today that God would complete you to do His will. Father, move in the hearts of all of us right now, I pray, and change us. Change our hearts. Give us a desire to not only be burdened, but to wake up and do what You've called us to do, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Standing as we sing, you come as God is speaking to you.
as we close, I'm going to ask us to pray once again for our Ukrainian friends. And as we close the service, just want to pray for them one last time. And I ask if, if you're comfortable holding hands, if you'll grab a hand to someone next to you. If you're not comfortable and want to put a hand on their shoulder or whatever, just kind of gather around with folks close to you. And let's pray specifically. Um, I'm not going to name all the names, but if you will pray for David and Katya Sneed. I had plans, <laughs> and God still could do this, had plans of next year taking a group from here to Lviv to, to work with David and Katya, and I hope that God will still allow us to do that. But if you will pray for them. David is actually from the United States, but married one of my interpreters, Katya, and they have a mission and ministry over there in Lviv that's doing great work. And he's one of the ones that's keeping me posted. But if you'll pray for them specifically and others. And pray that we will get to go and do that over there. And let's close our service with this. Father in heaven, God, again we come to you and we thank you, God, that your good hand is at work. And God, we know that your good hand is at work in us and through us, and I pray that you would work mighty things in us and through us individually and as a church. I pray that we would be God's people in God's place doing what God called us to do. I thank you that people like David and Katya and others across Ukraine are God's people in God's place doing what God called them to do. And I pray for boldness and strength. I pray for courage. I pray for safety. I pray, Lord, that you would use their bad circumstances to bring about amazing good in the lives of people. I pray that there will be people get saved as a result of what's happening when they see Ukrainians praising the Lord in the streets and singing songs of worship in the tunnels and subways. I pray, Lord, for those families that are separated. I pray, Lord, for the leadership of Ukraine and their protection. I pray, Lord, for Putin, that you would change his heart. You can do that, oh God. Change that man, I pray. And others like that, that just want to bring evil into the world. And God, we know that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church, and I pray that the church of Ukraine will be stronger than it's ever been, no matter what happens. And help us to be the same. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.